Hello everyone. My name is Wilbert Den Hoed and I work at the Department of Geography at the Rovira and Virgilie University. Today I'll present my contribution to the online workshop about trauma and cycling. Urban policies and academic studies often feature cycling as a solution for urban environmental issues, safer traffic and healthy lifestyles. And rightfully so. Through the analyses, cycling researchers have brought to light cycling behavior, cyclists' experiences and preferences, and promotion of cycling as part of everyday mobility across different demographic profiles. Just as often, cycling researchers and advocates are avid cyclists in their daily lives. However, the, re the reality is that considerable segments of the population do not have access to cycling. How might we bridge this gap? We can start by acknowledging that cycling is not universally accessible to all, or at all times in our lives. This life course perspective gives us a hint on how to nuance the universality of cycling and of access to cycling. To this end, I will present vignettes of two research participants from a study on older people's cycling. They show the impact of a traumatic cycling event on health, cycling behavior and perception. On the other hand, they show how traumatic events in the wider life course can lead to cycling that is therapeutic and can help the process of healing. Why is this important? In contrast to the abundant literature on driving cessation in daily life, we know quite little about the ups and downs in individual cycling biographies and the circumstances under which people may eventually stop cycling. What do we know about cycling cessation then and about its causes? In the context of Malmö in Sweden, Ryan and colleagues find cycling cessation in later life to be a highly distressing experience, leading to loss of participation in desired activities. Continuing to cycle into later life seems to depend on personal determination and resourcefulness, but also on ease. If any aspect of the cycling practice is too demanding, be it parking near a destination, judging traffic situations, or lack of signage or resting structures, it could, I quote, result in an older person being unaccustomed to cycling and deciding not to cycle again. People develop strategies to overcome fears or problems and to cycle for longer, including making temporal negotiations of when to cycle or avoid certain places at certain times. Then, perceptions of cycling safety rely on social features, behavior of other road users, fear of crime, for instance, next to spatial features. Then lastly, cycling may be able to sustain mobility for longer than walking, given its seating posture and the low pressure on joints and the ability to moderate intensity. Other studies on cycling cessation are often skewed towards the risk and fear of falling, which may be a prompt for older people, especially at very old age, to quit cycling. Again, Ryan and colleagues add that cessation itself is caused by cognitive abilities, reaction, memory, balance, rather than by one's physical conditions. Other reasons to stop cycling are perceived incompatibility with other modes, especially not when not in one's hometown, or when carrying children or groceries. Although cycling cessation is not reserved to people in older ages, I want to show a typology of cycling trajectories in a recent study on older people, where they make a typology of uh, reluctant, resilient, and re-engaged cyclists. Um, reluctant being that people have cycled in childhood, for instance, 
as by means of playing and uh, have stopped doing so in middle and later uh, age. Brazilian cyclists have some, some ups and downs throughout the, the life course, but overall have kept, uh, kept cycling for all these years. And then the re-engaged cyclist has stopped for a number of years or even a number of decades, after which they returned to cycling in older age. I will now go on to the two vignettes. Uh, one of a re-engaged cyclist or an attempt to re-engage her cycling and one of a resilient cyclist. Elaine was an older research participant who took cycling lessons as part of exercise on prescription. She is 59 years old and is a lifelong resident of the city of Newcastle upon Tyne. She was a factory worker for 30 years before retiring with health issues. Elaine never cycled as a kid and only briefly had a bike at age 40. Over the years, she usually drove her car to work, to shop and to get her children ar around. Since retiring, Elaine has struggled with a chronic leg condition that affects her mobility and her physical and mental well-being. Encouraged by her doctor and her close family, she chooses to take cycling lessons, including technical training and group rides. Two months into her training, she recalls, I cannot believe how I can move my legs now. At one time, I had to lift this leg into the car. It was really bad. And now I can lift it up. I can lift my leg up. And still, I cannot get on the bike right. I can't lift my leg right onto the bike. I have to put the bike down and get over with one leg because I don't have much strength in my other. But I can still pedal, that's the main thing. And I can go on the bike as I never thought I would. Furthermore, in a group interview, she states her plans to cycle more frequently and use her newly acquired low step electric bike to go to everyday places as well. She says, Oh, I could do it for years and go further. We hope to do it more because at the minute we haven't done that much. We're just coming here and we rode around for three days over the weekend when we went out on the bike. But hopefully when my sister's granddaughter goes back to school, we can visit all the places. We can park our bike and do our exercise, come back and go take it to the swimming baths, don't we? A couple of months later, I found out that Elaine had left the learners group. It turned out that she had witnessed a fall of a fellow learner on the training ground. She rode the same bike type as Elaine and suffered serious injuries. A fellow group member explained what ensued. She says, Elaine has never been on a bike since. I mean, I wanted to take her out loads of times just to go around where she lives, but she's lost her nerve. So the second vignette, uh, cycling and recovery, is about Karen, who lives in Rotterdam and is 74 years old. She was part of the Rotterdam study I did a few years ago. Uh, Karen was born in Rotterdam, where she lived in various parts of the city, until moving to a northeastern suburb in the early 70s. Here, she raised a family and worked in another northern suburb about eight kilometers away, commuting by bike each day until retiring in her early 60s. Cycling has remained her main way of getting around since high school. During her working life, commuting, cycling with her children and for errands and social activities within the city. Her retired life has been characterized by several disruptions and bereavements as two close family members passed away. She also overcame a severe ir illness herself. In her own words, she now lives day by day and spends much of her time with her grandchildren and on hobbies such as painting, neighborhood work and leisure bike rides. 
So retirement brought a, brought a significant uh, change uh, to her daily cycling pattern by removing her daily commute. But shortly after, the illness and bereavements entirely changed her physical capability, her mental state, and subsequently her activity patterns. She says, I couldn't make it to the shopping center by foot after these events happened. I started training in my own way, at my own pace. 50 minutes of walking a day, then 30 just to get some fitness back. I couldn't cycle at first after the surgery. I had a hand injury and I couldn't brake or even hold the handlebars. I couldn't accelerate. At one moment, I started driving again. And at another point, I could cycle again. I can't be happy sitting on my chair all the time. You have to be the type for that. One step further every day. I just had to deal with it. Today, uh, a few years later, she explains that she says uh, she has renewed the kind of leisure cycling that she enjoyed when she was young. Uh, she shows she now shows an interest in the landscape and started to cycle more recreationally with a group of friends, both in the Netherlands and abroad. Locally, she continues to cycle for shopping, neighborhood activities and grandchild care. The map on the right is a demonstration of her weekly activities at the time, showing a mixed use of travel modes, her local walking and cycling, and one large recreational ride in a rural area south or southwest of Rotterdam. She goes on to explain that returning to cycle, to cycle helped her to recover physically, but also to be able to access the activities that have made her cope with loss and bereavement. So from those two vignettes, um, I've distilled three topics or questions that I would like to bring into this workshop. Firstly, the fragility of cycling bi biographies. While I'll, I particularly treated Elaine's case as incidental within the interview data, her short-lived cycling biography reveals the fragility that characterizes the learner's experience. Cycling is a bodily competence that reaches beyond the influence of physical infrastructure or soft conditions to cycle. Having a bike, a bike path, and the intrinsic skill to cycle is not enough for Elaine to continue her learning experience and continue her plans to cycle in her everyday mobility. Second, the relationality of cycling group dynamics. Cycling was found relational through shared trauma, creating new mental barriers to cycling. Elaine witnessed a fall of a fellow learner who shared a number of personal features with her and no longer dared to, to ride the bike as a result. The other women in, of the group were concerned about her and felt they lost her as she wasn't part of the group anymore and missed out on activities with her new friends. Her short-lived cycling experience left Elaine to no longer be able, no longer able to access the social space of the group and learners' rights. Cycling is also relational through the shared recovery in which cycling aids physical recovery and mental resilience to overcome injuries, setbacks, and bereavements. With the help of others, friends or fellow cyclists, Karen managed to pick up her active post-retirement lifestyle as part of the social and spatial constellations that allow her cycling practice to endure in everyday mobility. And then the third question I would like to raise is, are cases like Elaine's outliers in cycling research? I certainly treated her as one in subsequent analysis informed by the focus of my research on the continuity of cycling, but actually maybe at the expense of the, the ruptures, delays and returns that characterize the cycling biography. Myself included, 
it's easy to overlook the basic conditions to start, maintain and prolong cycling that emerge and disappear in one's mobile bi biography. The fact then that other novice cyclists also expressed that they were affected by Elaine's events reiterates the importance of cautiousness and risk in cycling alongside more positive values of enhanced well-being, skill and social life. Clearly, in the case of Karen and more widely across the, uh, the study samples that I had in Newcastle and Rotterdam, I was keen to write about the health and well-being qualities of cycling and about the resilience it offered, uh, in the case of Karen, to recover from personal and physical tragedies. With these conflicting attitudes concurrently present in, in the study group of the new cyclists, they should be given equal consideration when promoting cycling as a physical activity or as part of exercise on prescription. In addition, the existence of short and long-lived successes alongside side setbacks show how lived experiences of bodily aging and recovery are non-linear and carry contested meanings. While cycling is undoubtedly bound up with bodily competence, its combination with unforeseen events and traumatic experiences can lead to premature cycling cessation. Thus, cycling behavior cannot be promoted as part of a, of a, of a blank slate, but to have immediate effect should be carefully based upon existing mobile bi biographies. For instance, all participants of the study to a degree change their mobility practice under the influence of the aging body, be it to temporarily injury, uh, temporary injury or decreased fitness, not necessarily in a linear way. Even though people like Karen have prolonged their cycling uptake, this was not just a matter of continuation, but also of customization revolving around traumatic experiences. This adds a more precarious trajectory to the older cyclist typology, in which overall uptake, even when decreasing, may be a resource to cope and recover from dramatic life events. Even though people like Karen have prolonged their cycling uptake, this was not just a matter of continuation, but also of customization revolving around traumatic experiences. This adds a more precarious trajectory to the typology of older cyclists, in which overall uptake, even when decreasing, may be a resource to cope with and recover from impactful traumatic life events. That's it. I hope, you, I hope you've enjoyed my presentation. Have a look at this slide to see where my research goes next and get in touch if you have any questions, doubts or suggestions. Thank you.